All right, so today we're going to talk about um, using integration to calculate area between curves. Um, oftentimes this is covered in a Calc 1 class, so hopefully this seems like a little bit of a review. Uh, so we may run through it a little bit quickly, but we'll work a bunch of examples and talk about why and how you can use integration to calculate the area between curves. Okay, so um, the outline of the lecture is just generally, we'll talk about signed area, do some examples of how we can use symmetries, and then uh, area between curves. So recall the integration of a function over a, an interval a to b, an input interval where the x inputs live, um, gives signed area. And what we mean by that is, oops, sorry, didn't mean to do that, is, is this. So say you have just a, a generic picture of a function over some interval starting at a and ending at b. And then say your function looks something like this over those over that input interval. Then the signed area here, if you calculate that integral, signed area will give you um, the positive version of the area trapped underneath that curve and above the x-axis. However, if your function exists, again, over an interval from a to b, if your function is below the x-axis, that area will be negative. And that's why we call this signed area. Um, it's the area trapped between a function and the x-axis is positive if it's above the axis and negative if it's below the axis. And it's very possible that you got out of a situation for a function where you have both types of area. So say, again, our generic interval from A to B, and say it starts out below and then crosses and ends up above, you're going to get two areas here. This one is going to be a positive area value, and this one will be a negative area value, representing the actual area that's, that is, uh, that's trapped between the function and the x-axis, um, as we understand area and geom geometry, but just the positive or negative version of it. And if you evaluate the integral, it's going to sum up those areas, and you're going to get something that we refer to as, quote, net area. In this case, it looks like it's fairly identical, but it looks like the negative portion's a little bit smaller, so you'd get a small positive kind of difference between the positive and negative area amounts. Um, so if you want the actual area, the true area, you can use absolute values and calculate the area between roots. And just for review, a root is a point where the function crosses the x axis or where it has the output value of zero. OK, so that's kind of an uh, a review of signed area and the concept of using um, integration to find that. So let's do an example. Let's find the area trapped by cosine between the function cosine and uh, the x-axis over the interval from 0 to 2 pi. So what we're looking for is, well, first let's graph this. What is this going to look like? So we're going to do a quick sketch of the cosine graph. Since cosine at the angle 0 is 1, we know that the cosine graph looks something like this. Nice little wave curve. There's one full period. One full period, it stops at 2 pi and begins at 0. And then where does it cross? Well, it crosses the x-axis at its roots are going to be pi over 2. And the low hump there is going to happen at pi. And then it crosses the axis again at 3 pi over 2. So in these areas, in these distinct regions, I'm going to have some positive area. I'm going to have some negative area. And I'm going to have some positive area. So what happens if we don't do what I mentioned on the last slide and we just integrate cosine of x from 0 to 2 pi? Well, visually, it looks like those are um, identical positive and negative areas, kind of like, uh, I don't know where, yeah. Yep, so it looks like it should sum to 0. But let's just, let's see what happens. Sorry, that sometimes pops up like that, being left-handed, it catches a control. All right, so we have integral uh, from 0 to 2 pi of cosine of x dx 
Well, that is, what has the derivative of cosine? Sine has the derivative of cosine. And we're going to evaluate this definite integral from 0 to 2 pi. And that's going to give us sine of 2 pi minus sine of 0. Well, we know that sine of 2 pi is 0, and we know that sine of 0 is 0. So we're going to get our total area here, like signed net area, if you will, of 0. Well, that doesn't make sense. Like, uh, there is definitely area trapped between there. And that's because the positive and negative, like we said, are exactly the same for this interval. So what we're going to have to do is um, we're going to have to calculate this between the roots. And so we've got kind of three or regions here. I'm going to call this region A. Uh, I'm going to call that middle a uh, bit below the x-axis, region B, and then that bit above from 3 pi over 2 to 2 pi, region C. And so what we're going to do is we're going to sum up all of these areas. And because we want the actual geometric area, we know that that region B is going to give us a negative value. So we're going to use absolute values to turn that into a positive value. So for area A, we're going to get an integral. It's going to be the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of cosine of x, our function, dx. And then for area B, we're going to have the integral from pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2, again, of our function cosine of x, dx. Now, we know that this one's going to be negative, so we're going to slap a giant absolute value around the integral to turn that negative positive. And in fact, we, there's nothing wrong with putting it around all of them. The absolute value of a positive value is going to stay positive, but it's emphasizing that idea between the roots. If you take the absolute value, you will always get the actual true geometric area, uh, not signed area. I say, and then for region C, so this was region B, and then for region C, we're going to have the, the area, so absolute value from 3 pi over 2 to 2 pi, again, of cosine of x dx, and our absolute value. So each of these integrals is going to give us a definite integral to evaluate. Uh, they're all the same, so we're going to do the integration once. The What has derivative cosine of x? Sine of x has derivative of cosine of x. For, so for region A, we'll, in, we'll evaluate sine from pi over 2 to 0. And then to that definite integral, we're going to add, uh, again, our integral is sine of x evaluated from uh, pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2. And don't forget the absolute values. Uh, like I did. So this is going to be an absolute values. This negative air, signed area is going to be an absolute values plus absolute value of sine of x evaluated from 3 pi over 2 to 2 pi and absolute value. So for this first integral, we're going to get sine of pi over 2 um, minus sine of 0 and absolute value. This second region is going to give us absolute value sine of 3 pi over 2 minus sine of pi over 2 and absolute value. Plus the third region is going to give us absolute value sine of 2 pi minus sine of 3 pi over 2 and absolute value. OK, so I'm going to grab my red pen here because red pens are great. Uh, sine of 0 is zero. Some of these values are going to be zero. Um, so what else do we know is zero? Sine of uh, 2 pi is zero. Anything else? Well, let's see. Let's just go from here. All right, ready, steady, go. So absolute value sine of pi over 2 is 1, because it's uh, on the unit circle, it's pi over 2. Sine is right up there on the y-axis of 1. Plus minus 0 is just 1 with an absolute value. So plus sine of 3 pi over 2, well, that's negative 1. And then minus pi over 2 is, well, sine of pi over 2 is 1 over there. So sine of pi over 2 is going to be positive 1 over here as well. Plus third absolute value minus sine of 3 pi over 2, because 0, we, we've got the 0 there. Don't sweat that 0. OK, so sine of 3 pi over 2, though, that's down on the y-axis at negative 1. So we'll have negative, negative 1 in there. Well, that'll be positive. So the first one's going to give us 1. The second absolute value is going to give us positive 2. And the third absolute value is going to give us another 1. So 1 plus 2 plus 1 gives us an area of 4 trapped in there. So that's kind of a fun little fact that uh, one p 
period of cosine trapped between the curve itself and the x-axis is a nice clean number like positive four. All right, onward and upward. Blank second slide we didn't end up needing. So um, I'm not huge, I'll admit I'm not huge on symmetries, but they sometimes can be useful. So let's just kind of do a little bit of review of what it means for a function to be symmetric. Well, first and foremost, um, look the way we're describing things. Consider functions on a symmetric interval, symmetry, same on both sides. Well, the interval from A to negative A would look like if we had an X, Y axis, our inputs would go from negative A to positive A, and it would be the same on either side. So it's symmetric about the Y axis there. So even functions, um, our favorite even function is the function we just looked at, y is equal to cos, well, why not use f, yeah, but it doesn't matter, y, f of x, same thing. Uh, y is equal to cosine of x. What does that look like? Well, if you graphed um, cosine, you on an, a symmetric interval here, you'd have from negative a to positive a. Well, we know that cosine starts at one and zero, so it ends up looking something like this, right? And from here, you can sort of see that I'll do negative area in red, that the negative area is always gonna be matched by positive area. And if you sum all that up, you're gonna get the signed area of zero. So you're gonna have the same area. What we can do to exploit this, cosine is just an example of an even function. How we can use this for integration is, if you have an even function, you're going to have the same area, same signed area on uh, either side of the y-axis. So say I was interested in another example of an even function is y equals x squared. So you have a nice parabola and you can see that it's the same on either side. So if I wanted to calculate the, whoops, well, we'll just stick with that black color there. If I wanted to calculate the area trapped by this between uh, negative a and a, then instead of doing, you could do the integral from negative a to a of x squared dx. That would give you the, my goodness, my picture is so wrong here, and I'm going to fix it since I can't erase things. So that's not at all what we're what we would be interested in or what we would have. If you looked at the area of a parabola. Uh, you would get this. You would get the, not the area above, but the area underneath the curve. Yeah, that's right. But you can see that that area is symmetrical. It's the same on either side. So sometimes if the integral is algebra intensive, you can capitalize on this symmetry by making this change. You can say two, whoops, let's make that red. You can go twice. So it's the same area uh, from zero about that y-axis from zero to whatever point you're interested in of the same integral. And sometimes that can save you a little bit of work. And that's really why this is presented here. So for odd functions, you have a different type of symmetry. Um, and this expression of negative f of x is equal to f of negative x is the way you test it uh, to determine whether or not a function is odd, the same for the even expression above. So our favorite odd function is sine. So y is equal to sine of x. And what does that look like? Well, since cosine starts at one at zero, Sine starts at zero at zero, and sine looks like this. It looks like, what's it look like? No, yeah, it looks like this. It looks like this. Something like this. We'll just let it extend a little bit further. And yeah, one full thing like that. Okay, there we go. So you go between negative A and A, wherever those symmetric interval is, happens to be. And here again, using green for above and red for below, you can see that you have the same positive and negative area. So what you get is you get that opposite positive and negative. I like to use circle plus and circle minus as shorthand. So shorthand, opposite positive and negative areas will sort of cancel each other out, signed area. So if we, we looked at the integral, for example, of negative a to a of an odd function sine of x dx, well, since 
sine is odd, we just know because of the way geometry and math works. And since that um, you have that symmetry of positive and negative areas being the same on a symmetric interval, you know they're going to sum up and cancel each other and add out to zero. So it's kind of like sort of cheating. Yes, we could calculate this integral directly, but if you are aware of the symmetry of something, you can sometimes use that to solve complicated problems. So symmetries and definite integrals. So here's an example. You could use um, the fact that this is an even function, but that's not readily obvious. To establish that this is an even function, we have to, we have to establish, is this thing even? Well, the test for an even function is f of x is equal to f of negative x. So f of x is the function we're integrating. It's x to the fourth minus 4x squared plus 6. And then f of negative x is equal to, OK, so we plug in a negative for everywhere that we have an input. So when I like to plug in something that's a little tricky to think about, I like to just kind of say, OK, well, f of whatever is whatever to the fourth minus 4 times whatever to the second, 6. And so now we're going to plug in a negative x into all of these things. And we know that if you take an, a negative value to an uh, even power, you're going to get the positive version of that. So we'll write that as x to the fourth is the same thing as negative x raised to the fourth power. And for similar logic, this simplifies down to negative 4 times x squared plus 6. And so since these two things are exactly the same, this function meets the criteria and is an even function. And so um, if we wanted to evaluate this integral and capitalize on the fact that we know that it's an even function, we could do this where we're like, hey, this is a symmetric interval. And so I'm going to be a little lazy here and just write f of x so I don't write out the entire function again. Say, hey, if it's symmetric and it's even, we know that it's going to have the same area on either side. So we could write this function as two, or this integral rather, as twice times what will most likely be a somewhat simpler interval, integral, because we have zero being evaluated. And oftentimes it's easier to evaluate zero into a function, whatever we get as the result of our integration, than it is negative two. Uh, is that the way to do this problem? Uh, that I leave to you to decide. I think it's probably far easier to just evaluate that integral director directly and plug it in because it won't be that painful. But you'll sometimes see this, and oftentimes this is with uh, some complicated uh, trigonometric integrals. And sometimes you run into this down the road in Calc 3 where if you know a function's even, it takes a problem and makes it from a very, very, very challenging experience and algebra intensive and can really, really help simplify some of the calculations. So that's why we're introducing it here. And I'll leave the calculation of this integral, nothing we can't handle. So I'm just leaving it to, as an exercise. All right, so now we're ready to talk about the title of this section, which is uh, area between curves. So for area between curves, the idea here is, well, I don't know. let's see, two, two things can kind of, or well, more than two things, but these two things kind of summarize what can happen here. Well, so let's say we have two curves and both of them are above the x-axis. And we'll use some colors here. So say we have a, a uh, green and red are great. So say we have a function that looks something like this. Again, we're always integrating over a generic interval, which I'm just going to use a and b for. And so if we integrate for a and b, we're going to get, whoops, let's make this green. We're going to get this green area trapped in here. Let's call this thing f of x. Now say that we have some kind of function here like this, g of x. So if we want to know the area between f of x and g of x, what we need to do is we need to take away and subtract out the overlap. And so if you have this kind of a situation, you, you subtract the overlap. What that looks like in an integral is we can find the area between with the integral from A to B of 
our top function, if you will, f of x, subtract away the bottom function, g of x. Why does this work? Well, we know from our understanding of integrals, and I'm going to leave off the limits of integration here because this is just an explanation quick, that that means f of x dx, the integral of f of x dx, subtract away the integral of g of x dx. And so this guy is going to allow us to subtract away the red area uh, from the green area. And if you put that all together, you get the integral above. So what happens if you have some negative area here? So what happens if you have something like this? This time, you've got f of x once again, f of x. I'm going to leave out. Well, no, we'll do it right. We'll go a to b here. What if you have f of x? So you have this green function up here, green area up here. And then g of x is hanging out down here underneath the x-axis. And so it's going to give us some negative signed area underneath. So what happens when you subtract a negative? You get a positive. So again, you can just to find the area between. And while my arrow is pointing just at the uh, positive stuff above the x-axis, I'm referring to the entire area between f of x and g of x. The area between is once again given by the integral from a to b of uh, green f of x minus g of x. Well, why does that work? Let's let's uh, just kind of take a moment and, and look at that a little bit. Well, again, from above and our understanding of integrals, we know that this means the integral of f of x uh, dx which is our green area, minus the integral from a to b of g of x dx, which is our red area. And so what we end up with is we get some positive area for our first integral minus some negative area for our second integral. And sure enough, Algebra, negative, negative, gives us positive area plus the second area, because we're subtracting a negative area. So everything works nicely. Let's see. Uh, I think I had two slides on this, but squeezed it on onto one. So we'll skip this next slide. And we'll do an example. All right. So we'll do an example here. Let's find the area trapped between y is equal to 2 minus x squared and y is equal to x squared. Ready? First things first, we're going to draw, and I'm going to draw a reasonably accurate picture of this because you know what? We're good enough and smart enough. OK, ready, steady, and go. Uh, give yourself a nice little uh, x, y axis, maybe slightly taller in the positive y direction. And we're going to go by increments of 1, so I'm just going to label uh, the first one, and we know that we're talking in tick marks of size one. So we'll go in positive negative one for x, we'll go negative one for y, and we'll go positive two for the y direction. All right, now two minus x squared, x squared's a parabola, then minus flips it upside down, the two shifts it up by two, and so it's going to start here on the y axis, and it's going to point down something like this. Now, y is equal to negative x. Well, y is equal to positive x is the perfectly diagonal line with a positive slope. So y is equal to negative x is the perfectly uh, diagonal line with a negative slope. Uh, da, 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 da. So I'm going to let's erase that, make that titch longer. We'll bring this negative line down here. Uh, is this thing perfect? No. Is it good enough? You bet. So the question becomes, what do we do here? Well, this is a case. Um, this is a case where what are we going to get? It's everything's going to be fine because of the logic on this last one, where the to the left of the y-axis when the the parabola is on top of the line, it's all going to be, you're going to be left with just the positive difference. And then to the right of the y-axis, when you're subtracting a positive and a negative value, since integrals are just adding up thin slices of area, it's going to work out well there too. So we don't have to worry about our positive negative stuff. All we have to do is set this integral up. And so the area is equal to the integral of the top function, 2 minus x squared, minus the bottom function, negative x dx. Now we need to know what to integrate this between 
And this is where this problem becomes a, ch a slight challenge. We don't know the limits of integration because we need to solve the um, we need to solve for the intersection. So limits of integration to solve for the intersection of these two functions, we're going to set them equal to each other. Two minus x squared is equal to negative x. Uh, that is going to be some kind of a parabola problem. I'm going to move everything here to the right-hand side. Uh, zero is equal to add x squared to both sides. Negative x is negative x, and subtracting two gives us negative two. Uh, any quadratic you can factor, set equal to zero, and then solve the individual factors equal to zero. That's how you solve it. So x times x gives us x squared. What times what gives us two? One times two. And then we need a negative one x. So we're going to have a negative two and a positive one x. Each of these things, two things multiplied together equal to zero. One of them has to be zero. So we'll set them both independently equal to zero and solve them. x plus one equals zero leads us to x equals negative one. And x minus two equals zero leads us to x equals two. And so from here, we can see that this point is negative one, and while not to scale, the second positive intersection on the positive x-axis, that happens when x is equal to two. This gives us our limits of integration. We're going to integrate from negative one to two, and we're going to get ourselves a nice answer. So uh, what is this integral? Whoops, sorry about that. Uh, give this a quick save. Equals Two, the integral of two is two x. The integral of negative x squared is minus one third x to the third. This is negative, negative is positive x. The integral of positive x is positive one half x squared. Uh, we're gonna evaluate this from negative one to two and then equals a bit of algebra equals nine halves, which is 4.5. Decimals can be helpful for problems like these because it gives us more of an intuitive sense that, sure, if I was to break this thing up into square units, I might be have some kind of a grid that looks like this. And I can say, hey, you know what? Sure, there's one square unit. Here's two square units. And the rest, that all that area looks like it adds up to about four squares, four and a half squares. Seems like a reasonable answer anyway. Is nine and a half, nine over two, four and a half? Yeah, it is. I think so. We'll, we'll, we'll say it is and let a calculator be the thing that checks us. All right, let's do another one. Uh, this example, we're going to look at the area trapped between the x-axis, though the function y is equal to square root of x and x is equal to, I'm sorry, y is equal to x minus 2. Once again, we will graph this first and see what we get. Okay, so to graph this thing, Oh, just go ahead and give yourself a y-axis that goes positive two in every direction and an x-axis, or I'm sorry, a y-axis that goes two in the positive and negative direction and an x-axis that goes four in the positive direction. Okay, we'll get, get back to black. Okay, a little longer in the x-direction. Up by two on the y-axis, down by two on the y-axis, over by positive four on the x-axis. So what do we have here? Um, y is equal to the square root of 2, uh, 1 comma 1, uh, 4 comma 2. Our square root function looks something like that, sort of like half of a sideways parabola. And now the x-axis, well, that's this area right here. So we won't, we won't for now, we won't worry about the x-axis. And then y is equal to x minus 2. Well, that's a perfectly diagonal line that's shifted down by 2, so it's going to cross the x-axis and it, uh, positive two in the y-axis at negative two. And so the area we are interested in is overall what's trapped right here. Because remember, we're interested in what's in the x-axis, bounded by the x-axis and these lines and functions. So how do we set up this integral? Well, here we have to realize that there are, depending on what we're looking at, there are sort of two regions here. There is this region in blue where the top is the square root function and the bottom is the x-axis and then there's sort of this other region in green where again the top is the square root function but this time the bottom is that line that we have y is equal to x minus 2 and so i'm going to go ahead and label some of these things uh, y is equal to x minus 2 
here we have the x-axis and remember the x-axis is given by the equation. The y value is always zero for that. And then our top function is for this problem always equal to y is equal to the square root of x. So what we're gonna have here is we're gonna again have an integral that to, to calculate the area trapped here, we're gonna need two separate regions. So we'll call the, the blue region region A and the green region region B. So the area, the area bounded by these curves and functions is gonna be area, uh, whoops, that should be blue. Area A plus area B. And I'm gonna stop doing multiple colors here because it's just a bit of a pain to switch. And so because we graph this thing accurately and using a graphing calculator like Desmos is a great idea with setting these problems up. Okay, so uh, I can tell that the limits of integration are from zero to two. My top function is the square root of x minus my bottom function, which is y is equal to zero. So zero dx, that's my first region. Plus the second integral picks up where the last one left off. So it starts at two and goes all the way to four. And then again, the top function is the square root of x minus this time, my bottom function is x minus 2 dx. All right, get this thing set up. Do a little bit of maths equals dot, dot, dot. I know I'm skipping a lot of the algebra here today, but these are integrals that we hopefully have seen before and are capable of doing. If not, feel free to ask me talk about it. Uh, all right, so there's an example there. 10 thirds, what's 10 thirds? I don't know. Uh, I'll, I'll use a calculator here in the background. 10 divided by three. Okay, so that is about three and a third. So 3.33 units squared would be our area here. And sure, if I look at that picture, I could say, yeah, that seems like there's about three units trapped in that curve. All right, so sometimes you go when you're given something, you got, might have more than one piece to look at. So our next example looks remarkably similar. In fact, it's the same thing copied, but it just has the word again. Why am I saying again? Well, all right, once again, we'll sketch that graph reasonably accurately again, uh, a little quickly here this time. So grab this graph again. We know that positive and negative two in the y direction, and then one, two, three, four in the x direction. I'm gonna just draw a reckless square root, and then I'm gonna draw that diagonal line down hitting the x-axis at two and the y-axis at negative two. Then I'm gonna connect the x-axis here and highlight the area we're interested in. Once again, we want to calculate this interior area. Well, instead of breaking this thing into two separate integrals, we could instead integrate with respect to, WRT is a common abbreviation for with respect to, with respect to a different variable, y. So we'll set our integral up in terms of y. Our differential is going to be dy. Okay, so what is that going to look like? Well, we're going to be adding up thin slices of area in the y direction. So where are we at? They're gonna, you know, we're gonna look at this. And that integration is gonna start here at the bottom of the, the where our region is, and it's gonna travel up to positive two. So when I set these integrals up and I'm integrating with respect to y, what we're gonna get is we need this function is now our top function, and this function is our bottom function. And I'm gonna use red and green here to color this in and show what this looks like. Well, the green integral, integrating that top function with respect to y is gonna give me everything under this diagonal line all the way down to the y-axis. And then if I subtract out what's sort of between the, the square root function and the y-axis, I'm gonna subtract out this red area and I'm gonna be left just with the yellow highlighted area that I want. So what's that gonna look like? Well, when I set up these functions that involve y instead of x, it helps me to write down first, well, we'll write area, whoops, that's in red for no reason other than the pen got stuck in red, is equal to integral. And then the first thing I put down is dy, because that reminds me that, hey, 
I'm integrating with respect to y. So I need all of my functions to be in terms of y. So if y is equal to square root of x, then by squaring both sides, you get x is equal to the, uh, y squared. So this, what's the bottom function is now x is equal to y squared. So I'm going to be putting y squared into my integral because I want my integral to be in terms all of y. And with the function uh, y is equal to x minus 2, solving for x, you would have y plus 2 is equal to x. So for my top function, x is equal to, stop doing that, y, y plus 2. All right, so we know that to calculate the area between two curves, you take the top minus the bottom curve. So my top curve is y plus 2 minus my bottom curve, which is y squared. Again, focusing on the fact that I know that I want all the variables to be y helps me to set this thing up correctly. So we'll work this example really quickly. OK, um, I see those parentheses where just help there to help me organize my thoughts. So I can just integrate it directly. Integral of y is 1 half y squared. Integral of 2 is plus 2y. Integral of negative y squared is 1 third y to the third. Add 1 to the exponent, and then drop it down, multiply by it by the denominator it in the, the new exponent in the denominator, applying just the power rule here. Oh no, I forgot. I forgot the limits of integration. Well, what are we limiting? Well, in x, you look at the where the integral is interested over the, the interval on the x-axis. But here, we're interested in the y-axis, which starts at 0 and goes up to 2. So our limits of integration are from 0 to 2. So we're going to evaluate this from 0 to 2. And this is going to give you equals 1 half times 2 squared plus 2 times 2 minus 1 third times 2 to the third minus uh, 0 plus 0 minus 0. Be careful when you plug in zeros. It's not always 0. Like if it's cosine of 0, it's, it's not going to be 0. So just, but in this case, since it's a polynomial, fancy word for just a bunch of variables being added and subtracted together, multiplied by 0, you're going to get zeros on that second one. So we're not going to subtract anything. Pretty happy about how that worked out. Uh, what is this? That's going to be 4 over 2, which is 2 plus uh, 4 uh, minus 8 thirds. So this is equals, you know what, dot, dot, dot. If you do the math there, you're going to get 6 minus 8 thirds, which is something like 18 over 3 minus 8 thirds, which is going to give us 10 over thirds, the same answer we came up with when we did it as two separate areas and added it together. So sometimes by setting things up in terms of y, you can save yourself a bit of work. All right, what's next? That's it. What's next? To answer that question is this is the end. So thanks for listening.